Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics, uh, video number 27. This is the fourth video of Distinti's Universe. It's about the sun, which I'm going to show you is an Ether Dynamo. Uh, this is for general audiences. My name is Robert Distinti. I've got a master's degree in electrical engineering and over 30 years experience. Uh, if you uh, I've already been watching along with the new electromagnetism, uh, sorry, the Ethereal Mechanics series. Uh, you should have already viewed the video which is named Secret to the Sun. Um, this is the YouTube uh, code number. I've got to figure out how to put the uh, links up there. So assuming you've already done that, uh, we're going to start off by discussing a problem with humans. A problem with humans are that we live on this little tiny biosphere of the Earth. And whatever we see happening here, we say that's got to be happening everywhere else in the universe. If we measure the speed of light, to be, it looks like it's a constant no matter how we measure it, then it must be a constant all throughout the universe. And so our problem is we limit ourselves to what we can observe in this tiny little scum layer on the Earth, because that's pretty much where we live. Okay, for example, uh, if we go way, way back in time, uh, we observe that only living things move. So what did we do? Well, we assumed that because the sun moved across the sky that there had to be a living thing pushing it. And therefore we came up with a sun god. And we thought, well, the wind was kind of like a person's breath, so that must be the breath of a god. Uh, let's move into more present day examples with the sun. Uh, back in the 1800s, and I have an old book here from 1897 written by a Tyndale about the sun. And in this book, they discuss the theory that the sun was a burning ball of coal. Now, why would, you, why would they think that? Well, because back then, the only way they knew how to generate heat was to burn something. So logically, they're projecting what we learn on the Earth to out in the universe. So if the sun looks like it's a big burning ball of heat, the only thing they know that makes heat is fire, so the sun must be made of fire. Okay, again, we're projecting what we know to the rest of the universe. In fact, this book actually... Uh, discusses that the, the coal theory of the sun is doesn't make sense and they came up with a more modern uh, gravity contraction. I'm not particularly uh, versed in it, but that was the theory before we got into nuclear energy as the process. But again, the problem with this sun burning coal, pro it's only a one-way process. Okay, but then comes along the 1900s to present, they, we say the sun is a fusion reactor again. We know a fusion, so what do we do? We project that, that that's got to be the mechanism of the sun. Um, it's still only a one-way process, but the problem I have is that nature recycles. And I'm going to show you the sun is actually a two-way process. And but with the present theory, they say that the heavier elements are created in stars. So heavier hydrogen fuses into heavier and heavier elements, and uh, therefore the uh, mass of the sun must be getting larger and larger and larger. Okay. Um, but here's some contradictions. The BBC special states that the belly of the star strip nuclei. Well, if it's strip nuclei, how can we be making heavier elements without electrons? I, you know, that's an argument. Uh, it also violates thermal dynamics. Thermal dynamics says everything's going to a lower and lower energy state. Well, we're fusing things into heavier and heavier atoms. They have to be having more and more energy, so it's going against the law of thermal dynamics. And Shouldn't fusion be an energy sink? I mean, consider what we learned in the videos about ethereal mechanics. We said that heavier elements in the fission process, heavier elements go to lighter elements. This has an incredible release of energy and an increase in volume. If fusion is the opposite process, we would think, okay, lighter elements are fusing into heavier elements, which should be a decrease in volume, which it is, but it should be an energy sink. But we're saying we think energy is released in fusion? You know, I mean, if, it's re if fusion is a reciprocal process, it should be a tremendous sink of energy, not a release of energy. And the sun should be shrinking, because it, it does come with that as decrease in volume, a massive decrease in volume, when you fuse heavier and heavier elements. And so if the sun is pure fusion, it should be dark and shrinking. It, it just doesn't make any sense. So what can humans mimic? Well, we can make fission reactors, and we can make fission bombs, and in a lot of Discovery Channel shows, they went over all the details involved in the Manhattan Project and how the different methods they used to compress the uranium to make it more unstable and detonate. 
you never see anything on the History Channel about the how they made the hydrogen bomb. In fact, the only thing that they kind of release is that a hydrogen bomb needs a fusion bomb to set it off. And the other thing is, we've no practical fusion-based reactor has ever been built. In fact, I don't even think they get over unity. They, in other words, they put more energy in than they get out on these attempts at making fusion. So I don't think humans really know really what's going on with fusion to be able to say that the star is a fusion reactor. Okay, what ethereal mechanics says is the sun is a complementary fission-fusion process. Uh, I mean, the other thing, going back to this, I forgot to mention, is that when you do fuse something together, you need extra particles. You need extra neutrons to get that fusion to happen. And I guess when you have a fission bomb, you get those, the fission gives you those extra particles you need to get the fusion going. So it would be logical that if fusion did work, it would require a fission-fusion complementary process. And that's what ethereal mechanics says that stars are. So let's look at how ether controls fission and fusion. Okay, what we have here, this is a stability chart. Elements that are over here are going to automatically fuse into heavier elements. Elements over here are going to break apart and fizz. This is, this location of this stability depends on the density and the velocity of ether as well as the atomic structure. Some of these structures are less stable than others. Like for example, deuterium is less stable. So really this is, this is really a notional diagram because a true stability diagram would probably be a two or maybe even a three dimensional chart. I'm just showing this as a notional diagram. But atomic structure is, does play a part in stability. And we showed that in video 14 or was it somewhere around there? But ether ethereal velocity also has an effect on stability. The faster the ether is moving, the more this stability chart slides to the right. Okay, and as you increase the velocity of ether as it's passing hydrogen, hydrogen will start fusing into heavier elements, and the more heavier elements will become more stable. Okay, but of course they say that the reason for atomic clocks becoming stable is because of time dilation because of the motion. Well, pretty much I'm going to show you it's the same damn thing. So how does the dynamosphere, this is what I call the outer layer of the sun. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the coronasphere or the photosphere, or I don't know really what they call it, but this is the theory, I think it's like maybe an interbetween barrier. But here's what happens. The sun is massive enough to draw ether in at such a rate that hydrogen on the surface fuses into helium, and then its weight carries it down deep, and there's a certain part down here where the stress and the lack of ether causes a the helium to, to fission apart and the hydrogen floats back to the top. Okay, and this I'm showing this process with this rotating diagram here. And so what you have is you have areas where the ether can pass through because these particles have already fused into the helium and they're falling down deep and the ether can flow through here without being intercepted. So some ether gets through the process up at the top here where this stuff, the hydrogen bubbles to the top, the surface is slightly raised. Okay, and this and where the ether is able to pass through, it's slightly darker because it's cooler, it's more stable. And over here it's brighter, and that's how you get this modeling effect. At least that's the theory I put forward. But the problem we run into is that this fusion-fission process uh, breaks apart so many particles and a lot of broken smash-up derby components of the particles get thrown off the sun in the solar wind. And so what we need is we need <coughs> excuse me, a way to replace the stuff. that. And what we have now to replace the lost mass is the interior of the sun works just like the interior of the earth, where heavier elements are cooking down into lower and lower elements. And because the sun is massive, that process happens extremely fast. And elements are cooking all the way down to hydrogen, and that hydrogen replaces, replenishes the fuels that's lost. But we can have a runaway condition, because as you pump more and more hydrogen into the dynamosphere, um, it becomes very thick, and it becomes very, it works at a much higher rate. I don't know if it's thicker, but it works at a much higher rate. And it, as it works at a much higher rate, it consumes more ether. As it consumes more ether, less ether is able to make it down to stabilize the interior of the sun. So what happens is uh, mantle, I'm going to call it mantle material for lack of a better word, becomes unstable and it'll blow off a section of the dynamosphere creating a hole okay, which allows ether to flow in and stabilize the interior. 
This is the same way as a manhole covers blowing off in Manhattan, releasing pressure. And a sunspot is what that is. That's what I believe it to be anyway. And if you notice, if you remember, if you watch that video, they said the interior of the sun is where all the light is created. Well, this is a picture of a sunspot, and you can see the surface here, and this definitely looks like, now they don't look like the nice round circles, these look more like little, very thin tornadoes, uh, but you can look at them edge on almost here, and then this should be the interior of the sun. Now it looks dark here, but it's just not as bright as here. If you actually, the actual brightness of this sunspot is very bright, but it's just much, much darker than the surface. Uh, the surface is where that dynamosphere is, and that's where most of the light comes from. But scientists say that the light comes from the interior of the sun, so it would make sense that if you blow off a section of the surface, that the, this should be brighter than this. Okay, that's it's always bothered me. The sunspots are darker because this is a slower process on the interior, and most of the light is created on the surface of the sun, because that's where the dynamosphere is. Now what happens is, um, um, as the sun interior expands, interior of the sun expands just like the earth and because it expands it thins out the dynamosphere reducing its output and that's where you get a solar minima. Okay and the sunspot is where the outside has expanded to the point where it's producing energy at such a rate to starve the ether that's going down deep and that, st that starving of the ether going down deep helps expand the sun and that's that way there you get the on again off again process where as the dynamosphere expands, it starves the ether until allowing the core, I'm sorry, the interior to expand to thin the dynamosphere. And just like the Earth example, you get an on again, off again process where sunspots indicate the solar maxima. But in ethereal mechanics, everything is eventually going to cook down to hydrogen. And eventually the star is going to turn into a red giant, which is pretty much a helium core and a hydrogen outer shell. And this is a very slow process, but it's mostly fission, very little fusion. Okay, and we'll explain why the, how we can tell the difference balance between fission and fusion. And what happens is this is a very slow process. It takes a long time for the fused helium to sink down to where it's unstable and to rise back up again. So most of the energy is coming from the fusion of helium making this gas giant grow. Finally, the sun will end up as a complete ball of hydrogen. Thousands of times the volume of the present day sun, but only about 50% of the mass. Remember this relationship from the Earth. Okay, when the sun is going to grow in volume, the mass has to go down. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's look at the comparable ages of the sun. With the one way coal burning process, they said the sun lasted 6,000 years. With the modern, of the fusion-only process, they say it lasts 14 billion. But if we have a two-way fission-fusion process, then this sun has to be at least hundreds of billions of years old, if not trillions of years old. Um, except that it would probably never get to a gas ball because other destabilizing events like its collisions uh, and a whole bunch of other items would probably never allow it to get there. All right, let's look at stellar stability. Okay, these are the three classes of star. That's an O star, which is a blue giant. That's a G star, which is like the sun. And that's an M star, which is a brown dwarf. And a star, basically, for stability, you need to have the right ratio of the mass of the star to its surface area. Because the mass draws in the ether, and the surface area allows the surface to fuse. If you don't have enough mass, the surface ain't fusing. Okay, if you have too much mass, the star is going to go critical on you because you won't be able to get the ether down to the core. And so there is a ratio, a curve, of stars that will be stable and exhibit a fusion-fission process. Okay, and uh, black holes explode. We're going to get into black holes, detonate, and they send all kinds of debris of all different sizes out. And the ones that hit along this debris line are going to be the stable stars. A, uh, an M star is a brown dwarf. It is most, almost just a little bit more fission than it is fusion. It's extremely dense. It's probably a big ball of uranium or something heavy like that. And eventually it starts cooking down and it passes through the K and it cooks down some more and hits the G. And eventually it can go two ways. It can go to a red giant or it can keep going to a blue giant. 
Uh, more massive stars are going to go to the blue giant. Less massive stars are going to go to the red giant route. Uh, and these here, as you go up, are mostly fission. Okay, the difference is what elements you have left over here. This is just a hydrogen helium ball. Here, this is a hy mostly hydrogen, but you got heavier elements, which give you the blue color. Uh, eventually, this is going to go this way to an even bigger red ball. Okay, and what they say, and, and, oh, and the way scientists say it goes, they say it's, this is a young star, and as they fuse all the material, they get smaller and smaller until they become an M star, or they go into a, a, a red giant phase. Um, they have a lot of different ways stars can end up. It's not very consistent. I didn't really care much for it. Um, oh, and a, a black hole here, that is an all-fission star. Uh, I'm sorry, an all-fusion star. And we're going to cover black holes in the next, uh, one of the next videos. And you can see that one of the problems they have, this is their main sequence that they propose, that this is the lightest star, and this is the most massive star. You can see that they have the velocity should be proportional to mass, I'm sorry, the volume should be proportional to mass on the brain, where ethereal mechanics says this very heavy ball of, of uranium or thorium or some very, very heavy material will eventually cook down into a big ball of gas. Uh, and eventually end up over here, over here, depending on the original size that it starts up. Now, granted, depending on, and so most of the time these M-class stars are going to detonate into bigger balls and then eventually slowly, you know, move up. At least that's the theory I have now. Now, how do you read this spectrum? This is a spectrum from O stars to M stars, the M star being the brown dwarf, excuse me, the G star being the normal sun, and the O star being the blue giant. You can see that these are all bright lines from all the elements that are, that are being highly excited and giving off energy. These dark lines, these are dark lines. Why are these lines dark? Well, if we have fission going on, my friends, I'm sorry, fusion. I keep getting those words backwards. I apologize. If we have fusion going on, fusion requires a sink of energy. And so if you have hydrogen fusing, hydrogen's going to suck up the energies that it needs in order to fuse. And so this O big O star here shows that a lot of hydrogen is fusing. But because we have bright, there's a lot of fission. That's all the fission giving off the energy. Uh, fission exciting other elements. Okay, so, and now as we go down and down and down, what you see happening is that the hydrogen fusion starts dwindling, and we start seeing bright lines for other elements, which means higher level elements are fusing. So even on the star, our regular star like the sun, heavier elements than just hydrogen to helium is fusing. Okay, and so when we get to bright, a very the, the brown dwarfs, we see the majority of the star elements are very heavy, very heavy elements are fusing from titanium, from iron, magnesium, calcium. All of these fusion lines are, are pulling energy out to fuse, and that's why I say a brown dwarf is a very dense star. Because in order to get these heavier elements to fuse, you got to move that stability chart all the way to the right, which means ether has to be hitting this star at an incredibly hot rate, which means your star has to be incredibly dense to be able to fuse these heavier materials. Okay, and, and in my world, stars go from heavier and, until they start burning up the material and then they start moving in this direction until you have only the thing really you have left that can uh, fuse is hydrogen because you're now, even though your star is an incredible volume, it has very low mass. And because it has very low mass, it can only pull in ether at a high enough rate to fuse hydrogen. So a blue giant in my world is the end of a star. The brown dwarf is the beginning of the star, which is completely backwards from uh, Main Street science, mainstream science. Here's another diagram of star where my theory says that the stars go this way. Okay, if your star is light enough, it'll make a right turn into a red giant. And these stars here these ball of gas eventually go this way. And the reason why there's a gap here is because going from this point to this point is very fast, so we never, we don't really catch many stars in the interim. I'm not really sure what white dwarfs are. I haven't really studied them, uh, but it almost looks like the, you know the stars will vibrate. Between, that's just a guess. I don't know what really what white dwarfs are, but that's one idea I'm playing with. Uh, is that on their way up they kind of go from fission to fusion, fission to fusion, fission to fusion, because down here is, mostly f is more fusion than fission, uh, is more fusion, up here is less fusion. Because remember, down here, the reason why the luminosity goes down is because you're fusing elements that are pulling that energy back. 
whereas up here you have less fusion going on and you're allowing more of the fission energy to escape as light. Okay, that's uh, everything in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Um, have a good night.